Welcome to another episode of The Catholic Novel. Today we're going to talk about John Hassler's A Green Journey. I think John Hassler was one of the great novelists of the uh, 20, 21st century and never got the attention he deserved. Um, Rereading A Green Journey has been a terrific experience for me. Um, the characteristic I would uh, put on John Hassler's novels are he writes about people who are extremely likable, even lovable. And, and they're likable and lovable even when, he, even when he's talking about their faults. I, I, you know, I, I never met him. I don't know what he was like as a, you know, outside of his novels. But he must have been a very compassionate man, a very sensitive man. So that even when he's poking fun, and I'll, I'll give you an example of one of them in a minute, uh, he's, it, it seems gentle to me, okay? So, uh, the, so th these are people I, uh, he writes about people I know, and I suspect all of us know. Um, so this is the story of Agatha McGee, um, a teacher who is uh, in her 60s, very near retirement, and I, I guess, uh, I think it's okay to say, a rather conservative Catholic. You know, she's found Vatican II quite upsetting, uh, she doesn't understand why we went from uh, Latin to English, and uh, several, several other things she objects to. And now, uh, my uh, immediate reaction is almost the exact opposite. Almost everything that happened with Vatican II, I love, okay? But I want to I read what she says, and then I want to tell you what my reaction is when I read it. So this is early on in the, uh, in the novel, okay? So she's, she's thinking about her vocation as a teacher, which she takes very seriously. And she's thinking that what, what's happening to, contempor to the contemporary church? She's in, she's in church, the church of St. Isidore's. This is the description. The organ boomed. The choir stood up to sing, and out onto the altar streamed 12 acolytes, a cloud of incense, and the pastor Father Finn. It was a fine ceremony to Agatha's way of thinking. In the old days, you never judge Catholic ritual. A mass was a mass. But nowadays, church going could be a horrifying surprise. Guitars on the altar, female acolytes, charismatics babbling in tongues. Lucky for, for St. Isidore's thought, Agatha, that Father Finn remained the pastor year after year. He approved a change when Rome gave him no choice. Mass in English, communion in the hand. But when left on his own, he was too stable, according to Agatha, and half a fellow parishioners to depart from tradition, or too dull-witted, according to the other half. And lucky for the Diocese of Barrington as a whole, that Bishop Swales stayed in charge long past retirement age. Such a dear old reactionary, Bishop Swales. Surely his replacement, when the dreaded time came, would be some progressive hotshot like the current Bishop of Duluth, who last month had officiated at a polka mass in his cathedral. And, and it, go, it goes on. Now here's, the, you know, my first reaction is, I disagree with almost everything she says, and yet I really like her. And that, that happens to, to me reading uh, Hassler's, Hassler's novels, okay? Uh, look, I, I mentioned before that even when he's uh, gently making fun of people, it's gentle. So a friend of Agatha's, uh, it's, it seems to be a bit of an airhead, okay? There's not too much going on upstairs, okay? Uh, so her, her name is Lillian, and here's the way, here's the way um, Hassan describes her. The woman was honest, simple-hearted, and envi enviably placid. Nevertheless, it was a mind spongy with sentiment and empty of logic, and the light it gave us off was so dim that it sometimes made Agatha shudder the way she used to when she was six and afraid of the dark. <laughs> so in other words, it doesn't give off much light, okay? And yet as the novel progresses, you love, you love the friend too, okay? Now what's the main point of the, of the novel? What, what's the green journey? Uh, reading a Catholic newspaper, uh, Agatha comes upon a letter from a James O'Hannon uh, who expresses views very similar to her own. So she writes to the paper, uh, congratulating the paper on publishing James O'Hannon's letter. Then she and James begin a correspondence. He lives in Ireland. Uh, as the novel develops, you become aware that even though she's very strong, even though she's very dedicated, uh, Agatha is a lonely person. And as the correspondence with James becomes, uh, go go goes on for, for some time, he begins to reveal his loneliness to her. Um, 
And, and he actually asks her in one letter, have you ever felt lonely? Uh, now, the, what happens is she gets a chance to go to Ireland. And, of course, she's going to look him up because I think even, I think at this point in the novel, she almost suspects that there's some kind of a, a love relationship developing, which is uh, probably very good for her loneliness and maybe also for his loneliness. So she goes to Ireland, but then she discovers that James is a priest. She goes into, into a church with, that he's supposed to be a prisoner. Turns out he's on the altar. She is furious, really furious. She feels she's been betrayed. She feels he was, you know, uh, completely dishonest and so on. And she confronts him uh, and uh, takes, takes her quite a while to, to say she forgives him. Now, there's, there, this is one of the most touching love stories I have ever read. Nothing uh, out of the order, nothing uh, it, it, that isn't chaste and pure happens. All it is is two, two human beings are connecting through these letters at a deeper level. And, and that connecting at that deeper level is a kind of a healing for their loneliness. Now, there's a, there's a sequel to this called uh, Dear, Dear James, and I'm sure eventually I'll, I'll talk about it in this series. But let me just pour, uh, uh, comment on something here. Um, to be a person is to be made to know love in God in, in this world and be happy with him in the next. It's also made, we're also made to love one another. So I have come to, to, you know, through many years of reading philosophy and teaching philosophy, I have come to believe that everyone, the rich and the poor, the intelligent and the intellectually challenged, okay, uh, the powerful and the weak, okay, everyone is called to be a gift giver, everyone. And that's one of the most profound truths about the human person. Uh, to say that someone is called to be a gift giver is to say someone is called to be a lover. Now, unfortunately, we use the love, you know, we, we use love in uh, many strange ways. So what I mean by love is making a self-gift to another person. It can be very simple, opening a door for someone, greeting someone, smiling at someone, wishing someone well, forgiving someone. Or it can be very, very deep. Uh, I think the marriage vows are extremely deep. Take it for better, for worse, for rich, for poor, in sickness and health and the death do us part. I mean, a, a life commitment in love is tremendous. Same with, same with religious. Uh, when when uh, young men are, are ordained priests, just before they're ordained, the bishop asks them, are you ready? And part of the ritual is for them to answer, ad sum, yes, I am ready. Now, there are probably a million ways that I, I was not ready, okay? But out of uh, what you believe is a vocation from God, you take a chance, you take a risk. So I would say, uh, while uh, among human beings, a sexual union is extremely close. There's another kind of union, and I got this from the spiritual writer, Ronald Rollheiser. He calls it a moral union. And here's my understanding of it is, meeting another person at a very deep level and making contact. Not necessarily physical contact, not necessarily sexual conduct, uh, uh, contact. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm tempted to say a meeting of minds. That's part of it. But it's much more than that. It's not like I agree with you and you agree with me. No, we are, we're in tune with what really matters. We both agree on what really matters. And we find one another helping one. We find one another as an aid to ourselves. OK, so, so I help you and you help me because of this deep union. Uh, I think I, I believe there is such a, 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 you know, very, very close friends. Ideally, a married couple would have not only a sexual union, but a moral union. Now, I think, uh, and I'm going, to, I'm going to be more sure of this when I read the sequel again, I think James and Agatha have this moral union. But it takes a while in the novel before she, he realizes it, I think, right away. Uh, but she doesn't. And I, 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 I spotted what a really good writer John Hasser is throughout the novel, but especially when she hesitates to forgive James. She's that hurt. She feels she's betrayed. And at one point he says, do you forgive me? And uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not ruining the novel now. She can't, she can't say she does, but eventually she does. And you know that this is, a, this is a, a, an experience of growth in her and that she is healing him at the same time. So uh, Hassler is, I think, very, very witty. Let me just see if I can find here the, uh, yes, this is, James, this is one of James's letters. Uh, 
So she, uh, she becomes aware of how lonely James is. This is before she knows he's a priest. Okay, so here's what he said. He says, I've had only three true friends in my adult life, Agatha. When I was a young man teaching in Knockbridge, there was an old schoolmaster uh, named Haggerty, who was a delight to talk books with. But I left Knockbridge after four years and went to, Glen, to Glean. And anyhow, Haggerty was in decline by that time getting old and more drawn into himself. A different man at the end of my time at Knockridge he was than at the beginning, forgetful. Then after I was in Green for two or three years, I began to hit, hit it off with a shopkeeper named Johnson, a fat, ironic man who told uproarious stories. But Johnson was a Protestant, and there was wedged between us the disapproval of my fellow Catholics. They never came out and said anything, mind you, but it was always present in the air of that secretive, bigoted town on the border of Ulster, a suspicion concerning any Catholic who took up with a prod unless conversion was the motive. And when it became clear that Johnson's conversion was not my motive, they began spreading it around that my, con my conversion was Johnson's motive. Way off the mark they were, Johnson being the next thing to an agnostic, holding his Protestant faith by the thinnest of threads. Okay, so uh, O'Hannon, O'Hannon then mentions a third friend that he had and lost. So he's being completely honest with Agatha, and that, I guess, frightens her a little bit. All of a sudden, the relationship is going to a different level. Each is admitting loneliness to the other, and uh, each, I think, where, whether they're aware of it or not, is reaching out and hoping the loneliness will be healed by the other. Mm -hmm.